You may have noticed a new addition to my little set. Yes, one of my friends got me that for my birthday. Thanking you kindly. Before the video even gets going, I'd like to say that the Celts, at their greatest extent, could be found throughout Western and Central Europe, with some small populations existing in Anatolia. Obviously, this wasn't a uniform empire, and so over these vast territories, cultural and religious practices varied greatly. These religious and cultural traditions and the mythological stories they would become were also passed down orally as in speaking traditions, you filthy perverts. So in a sense, Celtic mythology and folklore is an umbrella term for multiple mythologies and folklore. Over time, various empires and religious groups would play their part in the disappearance of these tales. There's even some figures in Celtic mythology and folklore that we know almost nothing about. Today, however, we're focusing on one of the last Celtic bastions. We're looking at a figure from Irish mythology. The Morrigan. Know the drill. Don't forget to like, subscribe, share, and tap that bell icon to get notified whenever I upload. You can also get access to all of my YouTube videos 48 hours early by becoming a member on Patreon. You can also buy my book on Amazon, or you can visit my merch store and wear my moustache across your body if that's something you wanted to do. <laughs> The exact origins of the Morrigan are unknown, primarily because, as we said in the intro, Celtic mythology, let alone Irish mythology, has been lost to time for varying reasons. But as far as we know, the Morrigan began in Irish mythology and then spread out to other Celtic mythologies. The name Morrigan appears in both Old and Middle Irish, although the spelling is slightly different. I'm going to take a quick detour right here to say, my Essex accent don't don't hold out for any good pronunciation. <laughs> I'm sorry. The accented O is not present in the earlier word, being written as more. This can be interpreted as phantom. It may also be linked to the old Anglo-Saxon word mare, which you may know in modern English as nightmare. In Middle Irish, it was spelt with the accent above the O, being written as mur this time meaning great. This means the Morrigan can either be referred to as the Phantom Queen or the Great Queen, although scholars often use the latter. The Morrigan actually has several variations of her name, which I'm going to flash up on screen now. She has also been known as the Queen of Nightmares, the Mare Queen, and the Queen of Demons. As you may have guessed, she was in fact an Irish slash Celtic goddess who was particularly associated with war, destiny, fate, and death. The Morrigan is an omniscient deity offering prophecy and favour to the heroes of legend and her fellow gods alike, and also the occasional king. It is possible that the Morrigan evolved from an even more ancient goddess called Mormumen. This goddess was connected with the sun and kingship in Southern Ire. The Morrigan is also closely connected to the Celtic Otherworld, which... It needs a video all of its own. The Morrigan represents the circle of life and watches over freshwater lakes and rivers. That'll... That will play into one of the stories I'm going to tell you in a little bit. She is also described as the patroness of revenge, magic, priestesses, knight, prophecy, and witches. But again, this depends on the story that you're looking at. The Morrigan is also known as a tripartite goddess, although, again, this varies depending on the source. Sometimes she is a group of three sisters known as the Morigna, sometimes the Morrigan herself is one of the sisters, and sometimes she's just a solitary goddess. The names of the three sisters can also change depending on the story you're reading and, more traditionally, who you're listening to. One set of names for these three sisters is Bad the Crone, the Main the Venomous, and Fear the Hateful as put forwards in the Mammoth Book of Celtic Myths and Legends by Peter Beres Fidelis that I had to read for a script I wrote in university. Because when you write scripts in university, you have to also do the research. Yes, yes, I studied film. 
You should know this by now. It's also a very good book. I need to read more of it. You can see how far uh, I've just specifically read the Morrigan bits. Also, the Morrigan is in this as, like, her own separate thing. As I said, she's, like, she can appear, but she's not one of the sisters. They are, like, her sisters. She, she's there in the battle of... Well, actually, I'm getting ahead of myself. You'll, you'll learn about that battle in a bit. Sometimes the sisters are named as Bav, meaning Skulled Crow, Nemain, meaning War Fury, and Maka, meaning, in this case, Magpie. On occasion, the idea of the three sisters is just one goddess in three parts. The Morrigan is also connected to a trio of land goddesses called Eru, Bodba, and Fodla. The number three is incredibly important in Celtic mythology, and I was never able to narrow down specifically why that was. Some sources said it was because of the earth, sky, and sea. Some said it was because of birth, life, and death. And I'm kind of leaning to the second one, or a variation of that, because the Morrigan herself is part of the life cycle, as it were. So... I'm, I'm, I'm sort of leaning to that, especially with the Morrigan herself being a tripartite goddess. Um, let me know in the comments what you think, or if you know the answer, um, I, would, I would be happy to hear. Um, yeah, thank you. The Morrigan is a well-known shapeshifter, with her most common forms being a seductive maiden, a warrior queen, or an old woman. Most notably, however, she would turn into a crow or raven, and if seen on the eve or during a battle, this would either be taken as an ominous omen that everyone was about to unalive, or it would be a morale boost for those going into battle. This is, of course, similar to how Odin is perceived in some cases in Norse mythology. Her shape-shifting was seen as an affinity with the living, particularly with livestock. In fact, she features in several stories purely about livestock, particularly cattle. Although the Morrigan is most well known for her connection with war, bloodshed and death, she is primarily concerned with the prosperity and the fertility of the land, defending her people from external threats. One way the Morrigan protected her people was by blowing a fog over the land. This decreased the enemy's visibility and hopefully scared them off. <laughs> In the Libor Gabala Iran, otherwise known as the Book of the Taking of Ireland from the 12th century, the Morrigan is named amongst the Tuatha Dé Danann. She is the daughter of Ermas, who is in turn a daughter of Nuadar, a king of the Tuatha Dé Danann. It is possible that the Morrigan had several siblings, with their father in some tales being the sorcerer god Cedlin. The Morrigan had at least one son that we know for certain she definitely had, called Meki. It is also possible that the Morrigan had twin daughters called Aowith and Skafak. I should also mention that the only reference I actually found or saw of those two it was in a story about midway through the aforementioned mythology book. It is said that Meki had three hearts, but each of these hearts had a serpent inside. He was later unalived by Diane Kecht. Diane took Meki to a place called Moi Frategi, called Moi Meki afterwards. He then proceeded to burn the hearts and toss the ashes into the river Barrow, which means boiling. This name fits really well because the second the ash hit the water, it caused the river to boil. <laughs> Now, the Tuatha Dé Danann, or the children of the goddess Danu, who the Morrigan was a part of, invaded Ireland in 1897 BCE. And they quickly found themselves in conflict with earlier supernatural settlers called the Fear Bolg. These warriors were possibly descended from the third group of people to try and invade Ire. The second group of people that the Tuatha Dé Danann came into conflict with was the Fomorians. The Fomorians came from the sea to raid and just generally cause chaos, which is, is something I've heard before, but I can't place where. The Morrigan does occasionally have some horse symbolism, which has led her to be linked to the ancient equine goddess of Gaul, Epona. Now, the Morrigan played a big part in the Kaifmeg Turid, otherwise known as the Battles of Moitura. During the first battle of Moitura, the Morrigan fought alongside her sisters, casting spells at the enemy. After the Fearbolg were soundly defeated at the first battle of Moitura, the Morrigan would get involved in the second battle of Moitura, albeit in a slightly different way. You see, Dagda, a king of the Tuatha Dé Danann, would find the Morrigan and recruit her. 
Dagda was told to meet a woman before the second battle of Moitura. He would find her slightly south of his home, a beautiful woman washing in the river Onis of Kanat. According to legend, she straddled either side of the riverbank with nine loosened tresses in her hair. The king was... excited to see her? In some versions of the story, Dagda immediately makes his move. In other versions, the pair talk for a little bit before they get some cardio in. And in some versions, the Morrigan makes Dagda dance with her in order to secure her aid for the upcoming battle. There are some versions of the story where, when Dagda first meets the Morrigan, she first appears to him as an old woman. And then after they hug she becomes a beautiful woman. Either way, after they had practiced some naked wrestling, the Morrigan instructed Dagda to summon Rin's men and have them meet her and his enemy. The aforementioned Fomorians would land at Mag Sketney. The Morrigan also gave a prediction for the battle that the Tuatha Dee Danann would be victorious, but at the cost of great bloodshed. When asked what she could do to help on the battlefield, the Morrigan allegedly calmly replied, what I follow, I shall hunt, which has to be one of the coldest lines in all of history. She would also promise to summon all of the magicians of Aya to aid the Tuatha Dee Danann in their battle against the Fomorians. Now, just as the Morrigan had predicted, the battle quickly fell to absolute bloodshed, with the Morrigan herself inciting a bloodlust within her allies with her shrieks. The Fomorians would flee and eventually perish in the sea. After the battle, the Morrigan would proclaim victory on the royal heights of Aya, relaying the following peace prophecy. Peace to the sky, sky to the earth, earth Earth beneath sky, strength in each man, a cup full of honey, humour enough, summer in winter, spear supported by shield, shield supported by forts, forts fierce and eager for battle, fleece from sheep, woods full of stags, forever destructions have departed, fruit on trees, a branch drooping down, drooping from growth, wealth for a son, a son very learned, neck of bull in yoke, a bull from a song, knots in woods, woods for a fire, fire as wanted, walls new and bright, salmon their victory, the boyne their hostel, the hostel of excellent size, new growth after spring, in autumn horses increase, the land held secure, the land recounted with excellence of word, be might to the eternal much excellent woods, peace as high as the sky, be nine times eternal. Took me a few takes to do that in one. However, the Morrigan followed that up the same day with a doomsday prophecy. <laughs> I shall not see a world that will be dear to me. Summer without flowers, cows without milk, women without conscience, men not brave, conquest without a king, woods without fruit, fishless seas, bad judgments by old men, false presidents of the lawgivers, every man a betrayer, each son a robber, the son will enter his father's bed, the father also in the bed of the son, the brother becomes his own brother-in-law, none will look for a woman outside his own house, O oh, evil time, son will deceive father, daughter will deceive mother. Stories can also deviate on whether or not the Morrigan and Dagda got married. However, their union did become an important part of Samhain on the 31st of October every single year. If the pair came together, it meant the next year's harvest would be bountiful and the overall prosperity of the people would be an awful lot better. The story of the Dagda has some believed that the Morrigan had insatiable appetites. That's why she traded fun times for her aid. But by this time, the Morrigan had already visited Lu, one of the fiercest warriors of the Tuatha Dee Danann. When she visited Lu, she chanted a battle incitement that would bolster him and rally his men. So with the Morrigan already aiding the Tuatha Dee Danann and her regular meetings with Dagda every Samhain, perhaps the couple just really enjoyed each other's company. Really really enjoyed each other's company. <laughs> the Morrigan would later receive lands from the Dagda in a story called The Wooing of Emma. These lands would be called the Garden of the Morrigan, which, to be fair, makes sense. 
It is said that in these lands, the Morrigan unalived a relative of hers, which then in turn caused the wild grains that grow there to themselves unalive, just from the evilness of the deed. When dwelling in our world, the Morrigan's home is said to be a cave in County Ross Common in Northwest Ire. This cave is known as the Cave of Cruachan, or alternatively, Hell's Gate of Aya. The cave of Kruakan was regarded as the seat of the ancient kings of Connacht and is part of a group of archaeological sites in Rath Krogan. In one story surrounding the cave, Odras, the wife of the keeper of Cormac's herds, discovered that the Morrigan had stolen the herd's prize bull and taken it back to her cave. Odras bravely gave chase but eventually fell asleep whilst looking for the Morrigan who then turned up and turned her into the source of the stream of Odras. The Morrigan could bring victory just by filling her foes with otherworldly fear. Her shriek was said to bring great misfortune. In fact, in the Cattle Raid of Cooley, it's said that it terrified a hundred men out of this world. Now, the Morrigan shriek may remind you of another piece of Celtic mythology, the Binshid or Banshee. Now, whilst you wouldn't really want to hear the screaming, wailing or shrieking of I, Either. they both worked very differently. Unlike the Morrigan, the Banshee scream was a straight-up prophetic omen of someone's coming passing within the household. Although different versions of the stories and different mythologies view this as either a warning or the Banshee bringing the passing. Again, with a lot of Celtic mythology, depends what source you use, who you ask, and if you've got a time machine when you ask it. The Quinnick, a mythological figure similar to the Banshee and, according to legend, could be heard wailing days before the Glencoe Massacre, which, again, deserves a video of its own, could have also evolved from the Morrigan, because it is very similar to the Banshee. The Bean Nye, or the Washer of the Ford, was another piece of folklore that may have originated from stories of the Morrigan. If you were to see the Washer of the Ford and she was cleaning your blood-stained clothes in the river, you were pretty much fucked. I did find some comparisons between the Morrigan and the Valkyrie who took the legendary Vikinger, the Valhol, when they passed. So they both kind of served a similar purpose. Lastly, the Morrigan has been linked to Morgan Le Fay of Arthurian legend. However, the more part of their names means something completely different in the Irish and Welsh languages. <laughs> Some of the Morrigan's most famous appearances are those of her interactions with the famous Irish hero, Q. Culain. Now, perhaps their most famous meeting was when Q. Culain was defending Ulster from the army of Connacht, led by Queen Maeve. Now, during the cattle raid of Cooley, the Morrigan both aided and hindered Q. Culain, warning the brown bull of Cooley of the impending attack. But through some moderate scheming, she had pretty much set the whole thing up. Now, the men of Ulster set off to face this army, but all of them were brought down by a mysterious sickness. Almost as if someone had cast a spell on them. But, lucky for Ulster, one man did not come down with the sickness. Q. Culain. Q. Culain went on to face the army by himself and just invoked the right of single combat and just took the members of Queen Maeve's army on, one by one, winning each time, and after a few days of this, as bodies lie around him, Q. Killane had a visitor. That visitor was the Morrigan, and she offered him something that very few men would be able to resist. Herself. Specifically aid, but... She didn't just want to aid him in combat. Now, of course, if you've probably guessed by now, Q. Killane is a bit of a Geiger Chad, and <laughs> he just rejected her. The Morrigan then reacted like most girls getting turned down on a night out, and was absolutely furious. Allegedly, Q. Killane reacted to the Morrigan's advances by quipping, I do not have time for women's backsides. <laughs> of course... The Morrigan didn't react too kindly to this. So, what did the Morrigan do with the man who refused to simp? 
She made his life a living hell. First, she turned into an eel, tripping up the hero as he attempted to cross a fjord. Understandably, Cuculane was quite angry at this and attacked the Morrigan in her eel form, breaking her ribs. Not to be deterred, the Morrigan tried again, this time turning herself into a wolf and scaring some cattle, causing them to charge at Cuculane. Unfazed, legendary warrior simply pulled out his slingshot and blinded her in one eye. The Morrigan then tried a third and final time to take out Cuculane, this time transforming herself into a heifer and leading the stampede herself. Again, unfazed, Cuculane simply brought his slingshot back out and broke one of the Morrigan's legs, finally leading her into a humiliating retreat. After the battle, Cuculane would stumble across an old woman milking a cow, an old woman with the exact same injuries as the Morrigan. She kindly offered the weary warrior three sips of milk. Each time he took a sip, he blessed the old woman, healing one of her injuries. Once she was completely healed, she revealed that she was in fact the Morrigan and that she had tricked him into undoing all of his victories. Clever girl. Sometime later, when riding to another battle, Cuculane came across a woman washing his bloodied clothes in a river. As we spoke about earlier, this is a bad omen. What's even worse for Cuculane was the fact that the woman washing his clothes was actually the Morrigan, and later in that same battle, he was finally beaten and mortally wounded. However, being the absolute Geiger Chad that he was, he refused to give up. Now mortally wounded, Cuculane tied himself to a boulder to remain standing upright in order to terrify his remaining enemies. Depending on the story you read, he either does this with various forms of rope, or his own entrails. That would... That would certainly terrify your enemies. <laughs> in fact, no one would go near the body until a black crow landed on Cuculane's shoulder, signifying that the Irish legend had finally passed on. And the long battle between the Morrigan and Cuculane was finally over. I really enjoyed researching this. I fell in love with the Morrigan the first time I read about her in my big mythology book. And she's just a captivating figure we, that we we don't know nearly enough about. And I would love I would love us to learn more. I'd love us to uncover more information. But let me know, did I get anything wrong? Was there any part of the video you particularly enjoyed? Did you enjoy this video? I hope you did. That's why I made it. And let me know in the comments below as well any mythological figures you would like to see. Now, normally at this point in the mythology video, I'd maybe show some sightings and a little bit of evidence, but this time we're dealing with an ancient religion. So I guess as an agnostic, the question is, have I been swayed? Do I believe in the Morrigan? Well, it is said that she looks after her own, and I don't know if I can answer that question, but... I'd leave some nice comments down below. And with that, the video draws to a close. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, share, and tap that bell icon to get notified whenever I upload. I thank you all for watching. I hope you all enjoyed. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye.